You're listening to the Precision Shooting Podcast, discussing all aspects of precision and long range rifle shooting. This episode is brought to you by Impact Dynamics, advanced training for the precision shooter. And now, over to your hosts. Well, hello and welcome to the Precision Shooting Podcast. Oh, actually, I was going to see if one of you boys wanted to do that. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hello and welcome to the Precision Shooting Podcast. This is episode number 87. My name is Rusty and sitting with me, no surprise, Andrew and Greg. Gentlemen, how we doing? Good, good. Good, good. Self? Yeah. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good, good actually. we got a lot to cover tonight um, because we got organised and wrote some notes down about what we we're going to cover. <laughs> did we? <laughs> oh, I did. Give us a credit for it. Good. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to share the, share the joy around, mate. What have you guys been up to? Any shooting going on, Greg? Oh, no, I've been a bit quiet. I've been a bit quiet. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, look, I haven't done really any. I, I did go for a bit of a look around, but we uh, up at one property, but we actually only saw a fox on the way out. I so, saw you, uh, I'm presuming it was you, put a video up on the Hunting HQ yeah. uh, Facebook yeah, page I put that of one a fox. Up. That's that? actually from last year. Okay. Yeah, That's yeah. from last year. I just put it up. You've just ruined the magic, Andrew. Yeah. yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah, that was just a, a bit of a play and just because uh, I haven't put that one up on Instagram before. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, no, been pretty quiet and unfortunately missed out on a fox that got a sniff of my pretty bad BO and, and bolted <laughs> out of the, the area. Good. I've been Good. fishing. You've been fishing? How are you <laughs> going in the fishing it. world, mate? Precision fishing podcast yeah, is I'm coming. Yeah, I'm getting precision because when you're throwing 15 to $20 a lure into the snags, <laughs> you, you want to get precise. Yeah. Precisely into the snags yeah. is the way I'd go. Yeah, mm. you you pretty quickly learn, but uh, no good. You're doing mm. a few fish. And yeah, good, very good. I'm I'm currently investigating the pikey lifestyle. What's so that? like the gypsy, kind yeah, of freeloading loafer. That's exactly right. Yeah. You, just, you're not uh, left-handed, are you? <laughs> we'll get into this. We'll get into this later. Uh, but the the PRS is coming up, and I have organised a caravan. For yeah. the week that I'm staying on the range, Nomad. Mm. It's a 33 foot, three and a half ton caravan. <laughs> oh, you're going to be really doing it tough then. <laughs> Has it got a disco ball in the main area? It probably what? does. It will have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's not it's not mine, and fortunately enough, I don't have to pay for it. It's uh, yeah. been loaned to me, uh, which is very kind of the nice. people who own it. So um, we live in up in luxury. That's where all the parties we having. Yeah, oh. sweet mm. dance floor and all. I bet, I bet, because that's that's what we're really good at. Speaking of which, PRS, uh, we can probably we can probably put it out there that we are not far away from announcement about the next event, which is exciting. Um, I don't think I can go as far as saying that the dates are June fifteenth to the seventeenth, but I'll, yeah, I'll save that for an appropriate time. Anyway, that that news will be coming out soon. The other thing, oh, matches around, which we're going to try and cap off at the top of some shows. The Precision Service Rifle Shoot in Sydney is on the 29th of April, which is the same weekend as PRS. So it's a busy day. If you live in Sydney and haven't booked in for PRS, definitely get along to that. The Precision Rimfire Challenge, or is practical, Practical Rimfire Challenge. I've got on my notes the PRS, the PSR and the PRC. So the Practical Rimfire Challenge is coming up on the same date in Adelaide. Uh, so you can find out on Facebook about those two. Uh, those couple other matches. We'll put some notes, uh, some links in the show notes. Also, any other three-letter acronyms you gentlemen want to mention? No. no. You've got a smirk on your face, Andrew. No, I'm just <laughs> trying to think of something that's probably not relevant for the show. <laughs> uh, some other good news is this is a four-letter acronym. The uh, Practical Shooting SA Club, which I think we've alluded to previously on the podcast, maybe, which is a practical shooting club in SA, pretty clear on that, is about to kick off. So Facebook is up, Instagram is up, website is coming, and going through the motions at the moment to uh, get everything approved and should be up and shooting sometime in the next couple of months. So that will be exciting for all those in Adelaide and perhaps some guys in Melbourne who come over for a comp as well. Sounds good. Mm. Just looking on the uh, calendar there, I see what's presumably a number of shoots scheduled in. So Yeah, uh, for the uh, for the club, yeah, there's there's hopefully, hopefully re- quite regular shoots for mm. both Rimfire and Centrefire. 
which will be really exciting to see. So there was a shoot last weekend at Darling Downs, but that's now not relevant because that was last weekend. Good plug, that one. Got in in time. Yeah. If You're you are... PR expert, really, are you? <laughs> this Saturday night, there's a rimfire shoot, uh, not a rimfire shoot, a night shoot up in Darwin as well. Andrew, that book we got sent, Impact book. Yes, yes. You had to read through. I have. I've read through it a few times, actually, and glanced mm-hmm. back over it and whatnot. It, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, good. Good book. I think you know, it's aimed at the sort of person interested in getting into the, the PRS type shooting, mm. but doesn't really have a lot of idea. You know, it, it sets you out sort of from the start, you know, setting your rifle up and uh, you know, collecting data and what effect that has and, and so on and so forth. Mm. Uh, yeah, and then it obviously goes into technique, and but also um, you know, techniques and tips for, for practicing and preparing for these kind of shoots. Sure, yeah. You know, I think... Um, you know, these kind of shoots are becoming a lot more common now, but until very recently, a lot of guys had never shot off barricades and uneven, sort of unstable platforms and that sort of thing. And the book sort of gives a fairly good insight into, you know, rifle control and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I found it a good read. Okay, so. good. Yeah, I, I didn't, I, I had a look. I've got a PDF version, which I've had a look at and very much uh, echo the same thing. Everything in there is pretty good sort of content, mm-hmm. uh, fairly much for the guys sort of starting out, but it really, like it reads really easily. It's quite mm. sort of easy to digest. Well, I've been uh, actually probably much to my children's disgust using it as their sort of bedtime reading material. So <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be experts at it. <laughs> Well, one of them anyway, the four-year-old, he likes it, but the others are getting a bit bored with it. So but, let me uh, guess, they're going to be into shooting when they're older? <laughs> I think they're be. into shooting now. Say, yeah, it better be. <laughs> <laughs> so no, the, the little one, the four-year-old, he loves it. He can't yeah. get enough. So Rodney, you've uh, you've written a bedtime story. <laughs> For children, yeah. Just needs more illustrations, right? <laughs> well, that's the most popular part in there, yeah. So. All, the, all the photos, yeah. Yep. Excellent. Well, the really good news is we're going to give at least one of these books away. So we will put some information up on Facebook and Instagram and Patreon about all of that uh, coming up sometime soon. If you are interested in one of those books, uh, go grab one off Amazon uh, and you can get a hard copy or you can get the uh, the ebook. So thanks to Rodney for sending those over. Hey, Andrew, have you bought a tripod yet? No, no, not yet. I'm just in the sort of critical examination stage. It might be there for a little while, but... Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm still fairly set on on the configuration I sort of discussed last time. I've been offered uh, a tripod to have a look at and have a use and have a play with. I think the the setup of you know the fairly solid tripod with a um, really right stuff mount uh, using the Arca rail is probably what I'm erring towards. Yeah, I don't I don't know if you saw, but there was some feedback about that uh, on Facebook about the. Uh, that particular really right stuff, ball head. Mm. And it was very positive. Uh, I'm just trying to bring it up here. Yeah, I didn't actually read that, but I mean, it's <laughs> all the... Yeah, some of us have got to work for a living. <laughs> but no, I mean, obviously all the reviews that I've been able to find have been positive. Like, I haven't found any negatives about that unit, so... Mm. No, excellent. We also got a message uh, here... Which I thought you'd be interested in, Greg. Did you see this one at all? This I did see those. Yeah, that's that's an interesting way of doing business. So this is a well. I think I think uh, what was the gentleman's name? James. James had my problem not understanding how many legs a tripod had uh, from last episode. And <laughs> uh, this is four pieces of timber with sort of some st- straps and, yeah, it's and like bolts two, through. Two sets of yeah, shooting t- sticks joined at the bottom, sort of thing. Yeah, sort of halfway up, or yeah. well, actually, maybe at the people. Well. You know, probably what would be better is if they actually is that is that up on the. No, this is this is theatre of the mind, Andrew. We're going to describe yeah. it really clearly, so no one needs to go and look at the picture that will be in the show notes. Mm. Well, that's what I was sort of getting at. Let's right. just direct them. Where we so want there's this. Explain that one, Greg, because you you've used something similar. We use the shooting sticks like yeah, like yeah, that. It, it basically looks like two sets of shooting sticks. One's lined up with the rear of the gun. One's lined up with the, the fore end of the gun. Mm. And there's like a bit of, um, a bit of like, a, what would you call it, seatbelt material sort of thing, just holding the two together so they don't open too far and basically fall apart. Mm. So, yeah, it just looks like a an improved version of a, um, of a set of shooting sticks. So, yeah, but I'd be really intrigued to see how stable that is and how easy it is to sort of fold up. 
Yeah. Um, well, I've seen a few commercial brands of those getting around as well. But uh, this particular fella, uh, I don't know what his name was again, but uh, looks like he's made those up himself out of... He has, and that's imagine to be fairly pretty cheap. effective. Yeah, yeah, he said he's decked a few foxes with it, so... What is, what is interesting, I, I just came to mind then, is um, I, I know a lot of guys that have hunted in Africa and it's really common over there for shooting sticks to be used. And normally, mm. like, the, the pro hunter or the guide will carry the sticks and, you know, put them out mm. for the shooter, you know, when the shot presents itself. And that's something, you, you know, it makes sense. I mean, often over there, again, it's just timber or cane, kind of sticks with, you know, leather kind of binding, very light, very cheap. You know, it can be made mm. quickly and easily, but yet it really would increase your sort of stability over a freehand shot. Yeah, over freehand with heavy You just rifles. don't see that sort of thing here. Yeah. You you really don't see people using that kind of setup here. Mm. wonder why. I mean, it, it's an interesting question. Why, you know, I think if people use them, they'd be pretty, uh, yeah, pretty no, impressed with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Mm. So I got, to, I got distracted by a post, which I think is very important. Remind me about the post about uh, Greg's tonsils in a moment. Um, <laughs> We'll, we'll get to that. That could go to weird places. <laughs> it will. It already <laughs> has. <laughs> it already has. The uh, uh, we we did get a few other photos. So thanks for the guys who did send uh, photos through. I'm just trying to find some of them, but they they were just you know good setups on tripods, which was really good to be able to see. Yeah, there's one on a an Accuracy International on uh, the Arco Yeah, yeah. That one that I had seen before uh, as the AI specific mount. Yep. Which again, uh, same concept really. I mean, having a, a mount which you know, affixes to the ball head itself. Hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. It, was, it was good. All right, so in the comments that I saw, someone asked, who has the most golden of tonsils? Gre- our very own Greg, Money Man Badco, or John from 8541 Tactical? Ooh, I reckon John's got that one. Modest and wealthy. <laughs> I'm just trying to dive in. Ladies. <laughs> uh, I reckon that's probably almost worth a uh, worth a poll on Facebook. You know what we need to do? We need to organise a um, a Skype podcast with uh, John. It'd be, it'd be a tonsil have, off. And have Greg on there as well. Just get them to recite passages of text. <laughs> and, see and then get people who are not from the US and not from Australia to vote on which sounds best. I think we're going to hook this up. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I don't know if John listens to the podcast, but uh, we, we're coming for you, John. This is uh, this will be this will be good fun. I did have a little listen to uh, some of the Hunting HQ podcasts the other day. Which is all right, a, all right, let's do this. It's let's a little interesting. I, well, I, this morning I jumped in the car, thought, yeah, exciting new H, uh, Hunting HQ podcast. Mm. Let's get into it. I mean, look, we probably shouldn't delve too deeply because... We, we were mentioned. We were just... Let's well, say no, we were I mentioned. Was, no, we, we were collectively yeah. mentioned. Yeah. Start. yeah. Start. I don't know. I, just, I feel com- uncomfortable, uh, you know, sort of engaging in a bit of a tit for tat. It's kind of <laughs> like when you have an argument with a, a, you know, a left-hander in particular, it, it's kind of like if you're having a battle of the wills, or the wits, sorry, it's kind of like... Fighting an unarmed man, really, it just doesn't or, feel right. Or it's satisfying. Out, bowling out a six-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so let's bring this up. Simon, our former good friend from Hunting HQ, <laughs> decided to go on a little bit of a rant on the uh, last Hunting HQ episode, where he uh, perhaps got a little ahead of himself and decided to try and defend all left-handers. Now we we've been known to. Uh, make mention of left-handers and their place in the world on our podcast. You know, just appropriate. Like stating facts, really. Stating facts That's is, all it's been. is all we've been doing. But it seems that Simo's perhaps in a you know bad place in life and he's taken it a, a little bit sort of to heart. Now, Greg, you were there and, and you know, we'll get you a take on, on how things went down in the room. But he proceeded to present some subjective suggestions of... And, and very cherry-picked uh, suggestions of people who throughout history perhaps have achieved exciting things, who may have been left-handed, according to Wikipedia, and some tyrants uh, throughout history who have been uh, reported to be right-handers. And because of these uh, Wikipedia articles he may or may not have edited prior to researching them, he has thought that that scored a point for left-handers somehow 
Well, you can't blame him for thinking that. He is left-handed. But, uh, I mean, look, we're not going to... There's no point getting into the, you know, sort of indisputed facts that, you know, people like Osama Bin Laden and, and Jack the Ripper and these yeah. kind of uh, savoury characters... We wouldn't, we wouldn't even bring that up. No. Like, it, it's just it not wrong. worth the discussion. Yeah. Yeah, but Greg, you were you were there, and this is what I think was interesting is that he attempted to uh, put his case forward, and he mentioned the Precision Shooting podcast, and he mentioned Andrew multiple times specifically. I would have to argue, Greg, that you are probably the most vocal on your appreciation of left-handers in our community, where virtually every time the mention of left-hander comes up, the word drowning is emanated from your mouth. <laughs> Well, it should be done at birth. <laughs> and, unfortunately, <laughs> you, you know. can't you can't tell that early. You know, the defect is not evident you know, at that should, age. They and shouldn't get to Simo's age. <laughs> and, and he did not make mention of you at all. So he, here's my on the next one. <laughs> here's my point: is that clearly he was uh, he didn't actually want to push the point with the person in the room because he knew he'd lose. Simo, Simo, I know you're listening, mate. Come, come here, come here, come in, cl- nice and close. Simo, look, I'm 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 not quite as bad as the other guys. Like I just I tolerate left handers. That's right, these guys have got no time for it. And I know you can lash out and sometimes that's a sign of inner pain. And you know, we we, we just want to say we're there for you, mate. You know, well we've heard about what you're going through and uh you know, we we, we don't want to sort of pile it on for you, mate. So you know, reach out. We we like to look after you. We like the hunting HQ po- podcast. Well we were like most of it, probably two thirds of it. <laughs> but Anyway, we, we'll, we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that and we'll, we'll, see, we'll hear what happens on the next episode there, whether he's uh, willing to take up the offer. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, the thing is, if, if left-handers were so great, everyone would make guns for him. That's yeah, true. Greg, I had a, a question about your thermal. We got an oh, email you? about your thermal asking if you'd done a review on it. And we've sort of alluded to the fact that you've thermalised most things that you can get your hands on. Yeah, pretty much. But I'm not sure, and perhaps not for a long time, we've actually talked about the model and the product and, and a little bit about it. So for mm-hmm. those who have, who have listened recently, maybe jumped on board in the last sort of well, 20 episodes really, uh, mm-hmm. who know you are into the thermal side of things, give us a rundown of what, you've, what you actually are running and a bit about it. Oh, okay. Um, so what I've got is a, um, a Pulsar... Apex XD75, which is now a dated model. Um, Pulsar have come out with uh, the Trail and the Helion, so they've got uh, two newer models. Um, But yeah, basically I bought that probably a couple of years ago now, I suppose. It's getting close to that. Um, I've always been a bit of a technology guy, so um, and it's something I've always wanted to own as a thermal, so I I took the jump. And uh, yeah, it's a great bit of kit. It... um, it doesn't have a lot of the features the new ones have, but uh, I can record video out of it. It has a video feed out of it um, that enables me to do the odd video. Uh, other than that, it's pretty basic um, and good at what it does. Uh, you can select different um, reticles. Uh, you can, um, you've can. you got up to six times zoom. Probably one of the features I like the most is the... Um, picture in picture so basically mm, you get cool. your, your minimum zoom as your main picture and then you, you have a little square at the top center of the center crosshair that's maximum zoom so you mm-hmm. sort of get the best of both worlds perif- peripheral vision as well as your zoomed you know money shot so it allows you to find the, t- the target quickly yeah, and then yeah, oh, moving focus targets on, yeah. it's brilliant yeah you just uh, or multiple targets it's a brilliant setup um so yeah it's a fairly um you could say basic thermal um, mm-hmm. but very functional. Uh, I love it. Uh, pretty much that's all I do now. Um, yep. Is, yep, lights off. Uh, the spotlight's got cobwebs on it in the cupboard. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't use light anymore, and, and, and that's one of the big fundamental things when you start using them is the behaviour patterns of foxes completely change when you take the light out of the picture. Yeah, sure. And definitely to the advantage of the shooter by by a large margin. Um but yeah, it's a, it's a great little setup, and and really, it, there's not much more to it than that. Um, it's a little like a OLED screen that you look through. Okay. Um, so it basically converts the the thermal frequency through. It has to use a germanium lens. It's the only glass that'll pass heat because glass is a um, insulator. 
so it normally doesn't pass right. heat, but this yep. is a very specific lens, and that's where most of the cost sits okay. on thermals is the, is the actual lens itself. Mm. That throws onto a sensor. The sensor converts that frequency to the visual frequency, throws it up on an OLED. Yep. So mine's just a black and white OLED um, where it really shows difference in contrast. That's what the OLED does. So gotcha. Basically, it's displaying differences in temperature from ambient. The darker it is, the colder it is. Can you do it black hot or... Yeah, it's white, white hot or black hot. Yeah. You can do both. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I've noticed most of the videos you've you've done, you have it white hot. So yeah. anything with heat is going to stand yeah. out white. And but you can yeah. reverse that contrast. You can reverse yeah. that. Um, yeah, okay. White hot, I find very easy to pick up living things, right? I just mm. can sweep sweep a um, field on it. I know everything alive is, I can see it. But when I actually flick it around the other way with black hot, I find living things don't jump out at me, but it's much better depth perception. Okay. It actually looks yep. really good reverse, but I don't pick up targets as well. But mm. I, I think it just depends on the individual and how your your brain is wired on what would work best for you. I, um, there's no, I think, negative in either one. It's just what suits the way you're wired. But, um, yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it. Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, it's a fairly big financial outlay, so you might have to peel off a few. Re- relatively. Yeah, you know, swipe the visa. <laughs> nah, it's... Um, you know, you might have to peel off a few toys. Um, but I think, you know, well, the price has come way down since I bought mine. They've come down a couple of grand. So, wow. you know, they're getting around the five grand mark for a basic entry-level uh, Pulsar um, trail. You're looking about five grand. Um, mm, okay. So, you know, that was seven and a half when I bought mine. And and what does it go like in daytime? Is it usable? Yeah, it's exactly the same. Okay. Yeah, the only, like winter, it's exactly the same. Summer, it's different ball game. It's all just white. Yeah, with summer, you can still make out everything, right? Right. You can still, because you basically can see the full landscape as though the lights were on. Yeah. Um, because temperature, you know, every, so every sun, blade of grass has a different temperature. Trees have a surprising amount of heat in them. Okay. Um, so everything's very, very visible and it's exactly the same during the day. It's just about the ambient temperature. So right. if the ambient yeah. temperature gets a bit high, then everything sort of gets really white and there's no contrast between them. So there's no, like it's very blurry detail. Yeah. But um, as soon as there's a decent cold difference between ambient, yeah. well, the ambient gets colder, sorry. Then sort of body temperature. Then everything yeah. starts to stand out and it's very pronounced. You wouldn't be able to use it for a comp sort of gun or anything on those lines. No, really. you, w- you wouldn't see the targets. Yeah. Because the targets will be ambient, and so they will just be invisible. So hard to hit. Yeah, very hard to hit invisible targets. <laughs> you know, I have shot plates. So I just strapped a bag of ice to the back of the the yep. uh, steel. And the other thing is, I use these. That you've probably seen little glove warmers um, that you can throw in your gloves that keep your hands warm. Little little hotties or something they call them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I use them as targets for zeroing. So it, okay. it, there's ways around it. Yeah. I went shooting with a bloke the other week and he was using insulation tape. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, yep. he'd in use it like as an X and then that would obviously yeah. heat up. So. Yeah, if you've got a white sort of background and you use mm. black tape, there's enough yep. temperature difference there. And you need to like, a, you know, sort of half a degree. Okay. And, yeah, right. and you'll make it out. And that's actually a pretty sharp image. It's a nice sharp, yeah. sharp edges. Whereas if you use a, like a heat, that heat, little hottie it'll, thing, it'll, yeah. it's very blurry, you know. It's like a blob of heat gotcha. ra- rather than a nice sharp tin foil will do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's several ways to Yeah, cool. To that. Yeah, great bit of kit. One more thing before we get into our topic for this evening. Uh, we've never actually asked for this before, but if you listen on iTunes, apparently getting reviews helps immensely. So, uh, in just in terms where you sort of rank on the page and that sort of gear. So, we'd really, really appreciate it. if you do enjoy what we do, jump on there and do a five star review for us. That would be amazing. What we thought we'd do is I mean, we didn't want to just be super arrogant and just read out the reviews that we've got so far because that would be silly. So, we have translated one of the reviews to Japanese. And Greg is now going to read Japanese to us. Well, I hope not. No, no, we've translated it to Ichi Japanese. <laughs> And then translated it back. Oh, God. So uh, this is what it 
one of the reviews is like if you translate it from English to Jap- Japanese and then back from Japanese to English. It might be worth noting this is the first time Greg's seen this. Yeah, I've just been well. throwing it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so shoot it off. Rusty, Greg, and Andrew offers a useful podcast interesting to Australia of the shoe tin game. I've heard some of the photography podcasts around the world, precision shooting podcasts, rather than continue the best is fun, great job so far chapter. <laughs> that, that really, That's Chinglish. That really hurt me. <laughs> I think my favourite part is the shoe ting was shoe and tin. <laughs> yeah, shoe tin. <laughs> I can't work out whether that was a positive or a negative <laughs> review. Plus one review. Yeah, there we go. So we got one. So if hey, you want to write you, us sir. a Chingrish uh, podcast a review or or just a normal one, <laughs> that would be really good. We'll get Greg to read it out either way. And then, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll translate it to Japanese or yeah. choose another don't, language. Don't and... make it so my head hurts like that one. <laughs> Hey Matt, I don't control the translator. I, I, <laughs> this is just this is all done by bots these days. So, a question has come through on Patreon. Thanks to our Patreon supporters, mentioned to them. Cheers. The question was about setting up a new rifle, mm-hmm. and this was sort of from you've gone to the gun shop, you've bought your rifle, your rings, your scope, your whole kit. I mean, you've got a brand new sort of setup, and you bring it home because you don't want the gun shop to set off for some reason. Uh, Greg. So uh, just straight off the bat, are we assuming a particular task, PRS, I'm guessing, are we? Or Well, all right, let's go. Because that's going to lead into some okay. decisions later on, I guess, if we're going to set up a rifle. Well, we could bring those those, oh, those decisions into it. Yeah, yeah. whether it be, uh, let's, let's say hunting or PRS. We'll, yeah, we'll all right. Do it. Yep. So you've, you've, you've got everything sitting in front of you. You've got all these boxes and... And bits and pieces. How do we go from that to a gun that is competitive in a comp scenario or is useful in a hunting scenario? Brand new gun. I mean, I would first thing I would do would be to thoroughly clean it. Mm. Um, often you get mm-hmm. you know, grease mm-hmm. in packing there. grease. Yeah. yeah, you know, like in Thick excess shit. grease in yeah. the with you know the, the raceways or the the action and that sort of thing. Even in the barrel, you know, <laughs> I certainly would be cleaning mm. the barrel before you fire it. Um, and just basically making sure that you know things like your all your screw you know screw thread you know holes are all clean and that sort of thing. But yeah, so are we assuming that you're going to put it into a say a chassis or yeah, let's let's say well let's say it, at some point we've taken the stock off mm-hmm. and and because that sound, sounds like you you're basically going to strip it back and then clean it sort of entirely yeah and then it's what, you know either an aftermarket or the same chassis but or, or stock let's put that back on there. What it would do is it gives you the, the chance to start from scratch with the stock, for example, mm-hmm. you know, talking the action screws up to the recommended, you know, torque setting on them. Mm-hmm. So straight away you know that that's sitting right in the chassis. I would then move to the scope mounting system. Um, again, same deal. If you know everything's clean, free of oil, then you can set up, depending on what type of mount you're using, you know, obviously you, you want to make sure every all the, the fasteners are actually tight, yeah. correctly tight. So I guess that's the time to do it, you mm. know, rather than if, if you get a gun from a gun shop or a second hand or whatnot, you, you don't know. It could be loose, it could be incorrectly assembled, things like that. So with a, with a second handy, uh, would you do the, you'd just go through that same process, basically strip it all back? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Start, start yep. afresh? Because I've seen some second hand rifles, you know, where you pull the, the barreled action out of the stock and the, the trigger mechanism is just full of oil and grease mm. and, you know, they... <laughs> Some need more than others to, to clean them up, but um, yep. yeah, it would certainly for sort of peace of mind. You know, you're starting with a clean slate rather than um, mm. you know sort of working with an unknown quantity. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. What about you, Greg? Anything to add into that yeah, sort um, of stage? Yeah, yeah, you know, I do all the stuff Andrew does. Plus, um, you know, I just recently bought a Tika off the shelf, um, and uh, you know, as we said. Straight off with the standard um, stop, straight into a chassis. Um, yep. I also wound the trigger out. Um, that's usually step one on a, a Tika because they're usually a bit, bit, bit heavy on the trigger. Mm-hmm. So I wound that out. Well, I actually changed the spring in there as well and wound that out just to get it a bit more, uh, a bit lighter. You're into those Yo Dave. Yeah, those Yo Dave. Yeah, there's an Australian company that do them now, but. Uh, 
Uh, Simo mentioned him on the uh, we'll move podcast. on then. Yeah, yeah, uh, left-handed springs. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, at a stroke because sometimes those yeah, Dave Springs take forever to get delivered mm. from the UK. So there is an Australian company. Um, look up Trigger Springs. I'm sure they'll pop up. Um, I'll so go steal the link from the Honey the, HQ. One. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Um, you know, and they're cheap as dirt, and they make a huge difference to you know if you can get that trigger, just sort of you know not how you want it, not too light, especially if it's a hunting gun. You don't really want it, you know, going off by staring at it hard. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it will help you tighten up your groups for your load testing. Um, so same as Andrew with all all the scope mounts, etc. Um, going over everything you know, talking, everything. Um, and then sort of the next step beyond that is uh, I've actually just gone and fired 20 rounds okay. um, just to get some fired brass in the chamber and start working on my reloading, um, setting dies. And it's because I'll, I've got, you know, a set of dies for each rifle. So um, just start setting the, um, you know, the full-length dies at the right height based on the fired cartridges. Um yeah, and that sort of thing. Just starting working on the uh, the hand loads, getting the, the reloading going. And, and All right, let's wind it back a little bit. I think Andrew's got some something in his yeah, step. Yeah, it's also, yeah. you know, when you, you're setting up the scope, for example, I think it's um, a lot of people don't pay too close attention, particularly some gun shops when they're setting stuff up. It's just slap the scope on, oh, yeah, it mm, looks pretty definitely. close. Mm. So, you know, setting a scope up square and... Mm. Correctly, yeah, it's a um, is a real big one, mm. which I I cannot do by eyeballing it at all. Mm. I'm horrible. Well, at see, it. it depends on on what your your mounting setup is. A lot of you know, a lot of scopes now they've got a flat um, on the or sort of underneath the saddle, you know, yep. basically directly underneath the uh, elevation turret. Mm. Now I know a, a number of scopes, probably the majority of scopes, they set the reticle off that um, flat as well. Yep, when they're putting the scope together. So having a flat there, particularly if you're running a if you're running a Picatinny rail, or some other kind of mounting platform with a flat, you can use um, yeah you know, blocks, you know, parallel bla- bars mm. or um, you know, feeler gauges to get it so that it's actually sitting perfectly sure flat and square on there. Um, mm. And then I guess it allows you. I mean, the setup process from there would be you know, you know to make sure you everything's your reticle square and mm. and plumb, but that would come sort of on the range, so to speak, as yeah. opposed to you know, in, the, in the in the shed or whatever when you're setting it up. Yeah, I think the, this is probably the the stage where I'd I'd you know put my bipod on and if that's you know depending on the style of bipod is, make sure it's sort of all set. You know, if it's a quick release one, make sure that's sort of tensioned up enough that it's it's going to lock down quickly and easily. If it's a Harris style bipod, then I usually give it a little bit of an extra sort of nip up or change over the bipod to like a uh, what are they called T locks or T nuts or something. Uh, yeah. Something to do with that, and make sure that it's all sort of locked down there. Again, I, I generally will spend a reasonable amount of time with the stock or chassis to mm-hmm. make sure the the height's right. So, going through the cheek rest and going through length of pull, if I've got those adjustments open to me. And I think in that regard, it's pretty important. Even if you're at home, you're not actually shooting it. Um, you know, get down in the positions if you're going to be shooting it prone predominantly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm actually get down in that position and set everything up off that because you often find if you throw it to your shoulder standing up, yeah. it's going to not be the same for you as if you're mm. using it lying down. I I generally will lay prone, do that, and then also go into the other positions yeah. and, and check it against it. And I'll even throw it to the other shoulder. And I actually found out uh, over a bit of trial and error that my left shoulder sits further forward than my right shoulder. Typical for a left just getting in the way, really. Um, Not conforming with the rest of the body. That's exactly right. Slightly deformed. When I pull a gun up on my left-hand side, it is way too far forward than off my Mm. right-hand side. Mm. So I I can actually change the way I put my head behind the gun now after I work that out. But you you can do those things and actually sort of tweak tweak it all before you get out to the range. Mm. But as long as you trial these positions, because what you'll, you'll do is you'll go prone, you'll set it perfectly for prone, and then you'll go into a position of, uh, you know, sort of kneeling or something like that, and you go, it's not comfortable at all. What was I doing? Just a quick one. You, you, you might actually just want to go and see a chiropractor or something, Sam, if your shoulders are that far <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it hasn't seemed to be able to fix it. I'm just going to deal with it. 
fair enough. But th- thanks for your health advice, yeah, though. That's, that's, <laughs> right. that's usually why I come here. I live to give. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's all right. Good. So that brings us. We, we've we've talked about cleaning it out. We've talked about sort of putting the stock back on, checking torques and that sort of gear. A little bit on scope mounting, so knock our base down. Do you guys glue any of that aspect down, your bases or your rings or anything? Um, I I now lock tie all my screws on my chassis. Okay. Uh, just two, four, three, nothing too dramatic. That's the lock tight number, not the yeah, caliber. Yeah. yeah, not the caliber. Um, yeah, that's just, just the way I've gone. I've okay. also um, depend uh, the mount I've got for my thermal. I've actually got to lock tight the the mount screws that go into the scope. Mm-hmm. So there's just a few little subtleties there that I I do. Okay, Andrew, what about you with lock tight? Yeah, I, it depends on on the gun. Generally, I like if it's got a separate rail, like a Picatinny rail, I will. Use Loctite again, not super strength. I just it's just to stop that sort of vibration of the screws loosening. Um, you still want obviously be able to get it out if you need to, you don't want mm. it to be in there forever. Um, I haven't Loctited the like the ring screws, like the top half of the ring screws when you, yep, gotcha. Um, because it's it, it's sort of tension there when you nip it up. I haven't found that to be a problem. And and you you're the same with that, Greg? Yeah, I'm the same with that. Just as Andrew said, they seem to lock in quite well. They're giving yeah. talks. Um, yeah, look, I, I haven't seen them loosened there. I have seen act, um, screws that secure a rail to the top of the action. I have seen them loosened before. So, yeah. um, I guess if you've got an action that's like the the fit, if you like, between the rail and the action is really bad, you can. I have done a few where I've bedded them. But with a DevCon bedding, mm-hmm. um, you can either glue it down or put a release agent in there. So you're just putting, like, making a a hundred percent contact for the with the bottom of the rail and the top of the action. Sure. Yep. Generally, I haven't really bothered with that a lot. But yeah, I mean, I don't uh, don't really lock tight many other than the this you know the rail to action screws. Mm-hmm. I, I certainly don't um, don't put lock tight on the the cross bolts that secure the rings or, or uni mount or whatever you're using to the, the rail. Yeah. I haven't found that to be necessary, mm-hmm. but yeah, other than that, no, I'd certainly don't put Loctite on the action screws, you know, securing the action to the stock or the chassis. Mm-hmm. Haven't found that to be necessary mm-hmm. either. Same. So. Sure. So we mounted the scope, talked about other bits and pieces such as the bipod monopods i guess are very much in the same category muzzle brakes screw muzzle brakes well same that that would be one i would go through you know presuming it's a a, a removable brake i would mm-hmm. go through when i was sort of pulling the gun down originally okay yeah i would just make sure the thread's clean of of any crap in the thread yep um Done have a look at then. the have a look at the crown and things like that Sure. Because I have seen some factory guns with really like with damage to the crown, mm-hmm. or, for example, or it could be so far, the actual you know the barrel could be defective to the degree where you look at the end of the muzzle and the actual the bore is really really off center. Yeah. Okay. Ironically, that was with a company that is in filing for bankruptcy. So anyway, yeah, yeah. I was going <laughs> to bring that up actually, <laughs> but anyway, we'll move on from there. How's those shares going, Greg? And plummets him. <laughs> is this is this where Greg comes back to a normal sort of bank balance? Yeah, all his money we will find out is tied up in Remington. Oh God, four hundred million <laughs> is not normal. <laughs> Good. So we're basically saying we've got the gun done and finished. Is that ready to ready to roll from a setup sort of point of view? Yeah, I mean, once I've physically sure. got it all set up, I'd, I'd bore side it. But obviously, I do that just. With you know by eye, effectively you're removing the bolt, mm-hmm. have it set up in a you know secure sort of setup on a sandbag, whatever, um, and and look through the bore itself. I mean, I'm presuming most people will be familiar with bore sighting. Yeah, we'll uh, probably link a video on here somewhere that that can go check it out if you're not. Yeah, and and get that done so that at least you're going to be on the page, you know, at 100 meters when you actually start putting rounds down range. Mm, for sure. Obviously, yeah, with a clean gun, everything's set up, I'd be probably thinking I'd be ready to start shooting. Yeah. Very nice. Excellent. And so what what would be your process? And let's keep it relatively brief. Greg, you've already gone into yours. You'll shoot off about 20 rounds or yeah, so I'd, and then I'd, use those cases. Yeah, I don't do the, the break-in 
barrel breaking routine. I don't bother with that. But um, there's a, there's a whole other topic. Yeah, so we'll leave that one alone. I think we've talked <laughs> about that before, actually. But yeah, I just get straight into it, and um, you know, I'll shoot those twenty odd off and 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 use those as a basis for setting dies and stuff. Andrew, what about yourself, mate? What do you look? I've I have played around with barrel breaking in the past, um, and to be honest, I haven't noticed a difference in. I mean, it's probably hard to tell a difference in longevity of you know, how many rounds you get out of a barrel, but certainly with with good quality barrels, like match grade barrels, I haven't noticed any difference in accuracy, for example, um, between sort of following a fastidious process and just shooting it. Mm-hmm. For me, I think the critical thing is not letting it get too hot. Yep. Um, yeah, I've seen guys, brand new gun, uh, just sit there and bam, 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 and the thing's smoking hot. I mean, too hot to touch. Were you there that day? You were in a hurry, were you? Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, I've I've seen I've seen so many people do it, and you, you know, you say to them, look, you know, you actually re- you reduce your barrel life dramatically by doing that more than anything. Um, look, I had a barrel which I was a Madco barrel, and I put, mm-hmm. I think it was I fired maybe three or four hundred rounds through it before I cleaned it at all. Yeah, from brand new. I mean, obviously, I put a patch through it initially to Start make sure with. there wasn't any oil or anything in the bore. Yep. after chambering. And then I just fired, yeah, it was, it was well over 300 rounds. And it was still firing the same size groups as when mm. it was brand new, like you know, first three mm. or four rounds out of the barrel. Mm. Um, I just sort of couldn't bring myself to not clean it after that. <laughs> yeah. I think it could be more of a critical issue if you've got a factory barrel that might not be finished to the same yeah, degree. I agree. Like a cheaper, nastier barrel. Yeah. <coughs> Remington. Well, well, that, no, that's, I've that's seen, a good example. I, I've got to say, they're... Or that's where I would do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you get, w- even within Remington, you know, I've seen really good ones. And yeah, I've seen, true. I've seen atrocious ones. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, if you've got a dodgy barrel, looking after it from the start it will give you a, a benefit. Yeah, for sure. Um, but, yeah, on a match barrel, it, I haven't noticed a difference. Yep. Yeah, okay. I have not, I have very much gone away from the, breaking in of barrels. I generally go and shoot them you know, for a couple of hundred rounds after that initial sort of clean up and then go from there. Clean yeah. them as needed, if needed. Uh, and, and I probably, to be fair, I, I probably clean it after that first sort of 100 or 200 and then... Wait till the t- grapes open yeah, up. I, yeah, I'm very much of a, I'll be as lazy as I can with the bore. <laughs> I'll clean the chamber and the bolt, but I will let that, that bore go until, until we mm. need to. And, mm. and my load development is usually uh, how quickly can I get this thing to under half MOA and then go from there. One thing I did see, I, I'd have to chase the article back up, but there was a a test done, I believe it was with 243. I, I can't recall what rifle it was in, but the two identical rifles. It was definitely rifles. right-handed though. Well, of course. You've just completely removed my train of thought there. That's right. You yeah. saw an article yes, about something. Um, article where the, the, the test was done to nothing more than monitoring barrel wear. And they started okay. with two identical rifles, brand new, um, and they fired, I think it was 200 rounds through each. Uh, no cleaning done. Mm-hmm. Same ammo, factory ammo. Now, the one of them was fired and it was really, um, they drew the process out. It was small strings of shots and let them cool down. The barrel didn't get above a certain temperature. Um, the other gun, they just blasted off as fast as they could load the mags and fire it. The, the throat erosion was like staggeringly different, hugely different. Yeah, right. Okay. You know, one barrel, like they, they cross section the barrels after that and showed them. Um, the one that hadn't been hot looked new, effectively. And the yep. other one that was just cracked and burnt out the rifling for a good inch and a half ahead of the chamber. And, and it was really the, the throat through to the, sort of the early part of the oh, rifle. Yeah. It mean, wasn't it, down. No, down no, the not barrel. down. I mean, it, that's, you don't get wear down. I mean, it obviously. It will increase as it moves further away. From, well, sort of, the most wear is right in front of the chamber, obviously, yep. and it just burnt the rifling away, burnt the throat away. Wow! It was it was quite dramatic the difference, and sort of that made me really brought it home. Like you see these guys just blast, blast, blast. They're just killing the barrel. That's all they're doing, just destroying a barrel. Well, I've got a thirty thirty. That's no good then. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> well, for a thirty thirty. I mean. Yeah, I mean, you know, you barely need a chamber for that. Yeah, just a piece That's of it. water pipe. <laughs> Throwing teacups down range. <laughs> yeah, spot on. 
anything else to add to that little process, gentlemen? I think like sort of Greg alluded to before in the, in the setting up the dyes, um, it, you know, depending on how many rifles you've got, but what I found is really handy to, to leave everything I'm using for that one caliber, that one rifle, not always one caliber, that one rifle, have the set of dyes for it and the shell holder you're using and you keep it all in the, the die box. Because once you've got, I mean, obviously your throat does wear, which will mean you'll need to keep seating out further if you want to be a certain distance from yep. the lands. But yep. um, it's just so much easier than, you know, I've seen guys have multiple calibers. Mm. Uh, you know, they might have, say, three or four rifles, all the same caliber, but different types of rifle. Very different seating depths required. And having to sort of go through that process of, okay, I've loaded for this gun yeah. a week nice. ago. I've got to, got to load for this one now. I've got to... Do I have a dummy round? Do I have to use a seating, like a, a mm. stony point gauge to get my mm. length? Creating a nightmare. Yeah, rather yeah. than just going, all right, that's that gun's dice. Yeah. I'll pull them out and away I go. Mm. So you advocate even if someone has two 308s, for example, set of dice for each? Like well, if they're... Well, I've, I've got two 243s. I've got a set of dice for each. Mm-hmm. But yeah. they are different brands. They are different chambers. And Yeah, look, exactly if, if they were... Says, you know. Say you had two guns that were... were identical then i'd probably say yes but you know the big one is um you know setting that that seating depth effectively if you got to stuff around with that every single time you're setting up mm. you're going to load some rounds well you know, yeah, you just, and the, the full length sizing die if you're just going to mm. crunch a couple of thou you're going to get variances on that probably even with the same model gun you're going to get more yeah, enough I mean, of a variance to have to reset it. Well, like Tika, for example, they're, you know, they're, they're good, accurate guns, but they're mm. renowned for having long chambers. They're on the longer side of the, the sort of tolerance. So say you had a Tika 308 and a, a Winchester 308, um, chances are if you take a case fired out of each gun, the Tika will be longer. It, you know, it may not chamber in the, in the Winchester or... Mm. Because it be too could be too long. I've seen it certainly wouldn't chamber in a in a factory yeah, in a custom gun. Sorry, like a yeah custom yeah, build yeah. gun. For sure. I guess that's one thing. You know, why you just touched on that is uh, um, neck trimming may be necessary, but pr- probably not so much with a factory rifle. But if you if you're putting on a match barrel and it's a new barrel and yep. you're running a either new new brass or or something from another gun, you might have to trim those necks. Trim the necks or turn the necks? Oh, turn the necks. Turn the necks. Ah, give them a trim while turn you're there. Analogy. I mean, you may as well. <laughs> yeah, give them a trim too. <laughs> but Look yeah, after no, I, meant, I meant turn. Tidy um, them up. Yeah, otherwise some may well not chamber or, or um, yeah. But that I found is pretty, I mean, if you're just using factory guns, it would almost be ah, unheard of. Fine. yeah. But, uh, yeah, if you're starting to delve into custom chambered rifles, it's mm. really going to be, Got to check. depending on what rema they use and, mm. and that yeah. sort of thing. So. Yeah. The other thing that I've found really useful, particularly that first session out with the gun, maybe even the second, is just keeping an eye on all those screws that you've tightened up throughout the throughout the initial process because I have had stuff come loose in, or seen stuff come loose in that first session where you go out and you sort of put it all together and then something just doesn't doesn't enjoy it and it's come come loose and, and you get quite frustrated because you think, oh, yeah, we've got it all tidied up. And, and you learn, and, and I've learned this with... With particular, uh, I've probably had a particular bases and particular chassis where they have become loose and they just notoriously came loose regularly. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you lock tight them down or you replace them and that really solves the problem. But th- making sure you've got the appropriate tools for that is what, really useful. One I saw just the other day on uh, Accurate Shooter, the Daily Bulletin, they're talking about, you know, Often, if people are having issues with you know, point of impact shift and that kind of thing on target, yep. they will blame the scope. You know, if they check everything, mm. you know, all their ring screws and the base and everything, all that's tight. Mm. There'll be that presumption that the scope is defective, and it does happen, yep. regardless of the manufacturer. It does happen from time to time. Sure, but uh, the the incident they relayed with one guy again had all this trouble, and someone suggested to him make sure your barrel's tight, and he checked and it, it felt hand tight. But uh, they you know, put it up in a barrel vice, and they said it nipped up considerably, like it yeah, wasn't right. actually tight. So tightened it back up, shot bang on again. So yep, that's pretty uncommon. I haven't seen that happen personally, but 
No. No, there was. Yeah, I'd imagine that would be almost unheard of with a factory gun. Yeah. Mm. I, I have certainly heard of that happening at comps, uh, but not factory guns, you're right. Yeah. Mm. Hopefully that has covered off at least a part of what we do with a new gun. Yeah, I think we're most of the way there, you know. Yeah. Um, probably joins on to the previous podcast from there. What about tripods? No. Okay, good. Just yeah. on that, how many legs would a <laughs> monopod have? Um, mon- money? <laughs> Depends who you ask, I suppose. <laughs> 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 it's very subjective. <laughs> Everything is subjective. <laughs> it's an unusual question. <laughs> Well, you asked how many legs a tripod has last week. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I did clarify, but I'll wear it. It was the name of the show. I was quite happy to wear it. We'll call this the monopod ep- episode. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think I won't. You guys hit us up with any comments and questions on any of these topics we have covered off. Uh, we will work out the Impact Book giveaway. A little note that we will have a bunch of podcasts coming out actually in quite short succession a number of interviews that we have done and slash still doing with some prs shooters obviously in the lead up to the vortex cold still open in muldura so for those guys who've got a big drive down um i guess you could listen to the hunting hq podcast you know if that was your thing with left handers but you know or you could listen to uh Paul Reed or Regina Milkovich or Mick Stubbins talking about some PRSing. So, you know. Oh, there's a hunter in all of yours. Yeah, no, I, I, I like the hunter. As I said, two thirds of it is my favourite podcast. <laughs> Jim, and thanks for coming in. I want to leave you with some words of advice, if that's okay. Yeah. Precision shooting podcast rather than continue. The best is fun. Great job so far. Chapter. Thanks for listening to the Precision Shooting Podcast. To continue the discussion, check out our Facebook page. And for more information, head to our website, www.precisionshootingpodcast.com.au. This episode was brought to you by Impact Dynamics, advanced training for the precision shooter.